but I do think we should talk about sampling. So I've got sampling in here just so that we know possible ways of dealing with sampling. I'll be brief about that. The first bit is that quantitative research will always start with a population, which is the universal of elements or respondents that you are wanting to deal with. And then we use a sampling technique because it's unreasonable because of time constraints and other constraints to get hold of all the elements in the population. That's why we use a sample. Between the sample and the population is a sample frame, which is a list of possible candidates that you want to target. Now, it is true that sometimes you don't have available to you such a sample frame, which was the case she mentioned, in which case your sampling technique has to do that. The sampling, sampling technique has to grow the population from the sample itself. I'll tell you about the that. Sampling, there are two ways of doing sampling. The one is a census. When you conduct the census, you're actually taking the whole of the population as the sample. So you have a perfect set of data because it holds for the whole of the population. That's why the government undertakes a survey, so a census, so that they can get hold of every element in the population. That's perfect. But how many of us are able to do that? So that's wonderful, but it's not real. So what a sample is, is a subset of the population, but you want to make sure that that subset of the population is representative of the population and that you could use that sample to estimate the characteristic that you are interested in estimating. So it's got to be a pretty good sample. The most used sampling techniques. Number one, depending on what you want to do with the data, you've got to make a choice between probability sampling methods and non-probability sampling methods. The one side there, the left, the, my right hand side, the left hand side, gives you probability sampling. And the other side gives you non-probability sampling. Difference between the two? In probability sampling, every element in the population has a known probability of being chosen. A known probability. Which means, actually, that the population is known to you. That's what it means. Because if the population is known to you, you calculate the element of you being chosen is one out of the total. So that's what it means. On the other hand, in the non-probability environment, every element in the population doesn't have a normal probability of being chosen, which means there's a sense of bias or unfairness or judgment into how you select the elements of the sample. Mostly, we feel that the probability sampling techniques are the better ones in terms of being unbiased and being able to generalize to the population. But there are instances where you can't get hold of the population, so then you are stuck with a non-probability sampling because there's no other way. And there are also places where the non-probability can give you a better response or a better answer than the probability of sampling ways can. So you again have to measure up the specific situation in terms of the possibilities. So let me explain them to you. Under probability sampling, we have systematic sampling, stratified sampling, random sampling, and cluster sampling. I'll explain what they are. Systematic sampling means that you take the population and you number them, let's say, from, 100, from 1 to 100. So there's the population. Now you decide, I need five elements from the population for the sample. So if I need five, I'm going to divide 100 by five, which means I'm going to take number five, number 20, number 40, number 60, number 80, and number 100. So I'm systematically walking through the data and choosing every 20th element. That's systematic sampling. So, or you can say, I'm going to choose every 10th element thereby I will have 10 elements in the sample. So you can choose the size of the sample first and then let that tell you how many, which elements you'll choose 
where you could choose the elements first and that will give you what the size of the sample is. That doesn't matter your choice. The problem that they talk about is that sometimes that particular rhythm pattern that you pick up in walking through the sample could identify some elements that have a particular characteristic that isn't one that you want. So there might be some pattern in every 20th element that you're not aware of up front. But you know, that is really not for me a big issue. So I, I take that with a pinch of salt. So systematic sampling allows you to systematically walk through the <coughs> and choose systematically every chaos element and you stick to that up to you have the size of the sample. That's the first of the probability sampling ways. The second one I'm going to explain is cluster sampling, the last one here. Cluster sampling takes the population and divides it in little baby populations, a lot of them. And every one of these baby populations should have all the characteristics of the population in them. Right? And then what you do, you choose X of these baby populations and that's your sample. So if I could draw that maybe to make it easier, if you look like this. Here's the population and it's made up out of clusters. And every cluster is like a baby population. It's got all the elements of the population, all the differences of the population in it. So maybe the population was size 100. And this one has size 20. That one has size 50. And that one has size 30. So then I randomly choose one of these clusters in my remote. I choose that one and I can use all 50 elements in that or I can go into that and do a random sampling inside that if I wanted to. Or I decide the size of the sample should be 60. So I randomly choose that one. Then I need another 10 elements, so then I randomly select 10 elements out of that one. So there's a random element within the cluster sampling methodology. Where would you use that? If you have a population that you can reasonably divide into little populations that all look like the population, it saves you a lot of time and effort if rather than focusing on the big population, you can focus on smaller bits of that population that are handleable. Let's say you want to study something to do with universities in South Africa. And you believe, according to the characteristics that you are investigating, that the universities in South Africa, every one of them, will have all of those characteristics. So they all become clusters of the population of universities in South Africa. That's not true for anything about universities. No? But let's say for thing that you're investigating, that is true. So they're all clusters, then you select out of the, I think there are 23 universities. Out of the 23, you select three randomly, and you use everything about those three, or you choose one, and you use everything about that one, depending on the size of the sample that you have. And then the elements in that baby population needs to be known to you, need to be known to you. That's an example of cluster sampling all of you. In a probability sampling, every element has a known probability of being chosen. In a random sampling, every element has the same probability of being chosen. So all animals are equal, except in for the pets. So in a random sampling, every element has the same known probability of being chosen. So it's totally fair. Totally fair, which is why you take uh, a random sampling into differential statistics because it's totally unbiased. The way to get a random sample is by generating random numbers. So if you open up Excel data analysis in Excel, there you can generate random numbers. So when a random number is generated, you compare that random number to the number of people in your population which you number from one to 100. 
and the number gets generated, the number comes up as 0 0.124. So you multiply that by, to, by 100, so you'll get 12.4. You say, okay, that means I'm going to use element 12. You're going to play with the random numbers here until they fit your population. Then you generate another number, you get 0 0.392, you multiply that by 100, you get 39, and the second element is there. And you continue doing that until you get the size of the sample that you want. So it's fair, it's unbiased, there's no influence of the selector in terms of the element selected. Stratification is probably better than a random sample, although it's based on a random sample. Because in stratification, different from a cluster sample, where you have every cluster as a baby population, stratification does it the other way around. It says every one of the strata will have a specific characteristic of the population. So this and this and that would all be totally different from each other. And then you draw this random sample across all of these. So you have elements from this, elements from that part, and elements from that stratum in the sample. And the theory says, if you stratify first before drawing a random sample, you get a better level of success, better significance rate with the same size sample as if you didn't stratify. Other way around, you can get a smaller size sample and be just as correct if you do stratification than you would have got if you just did a random sample. Did you follow what I said? So stratification, if you are aware of coherent differences in the population, use that. And a lot of the research that we do at universities you want to conduct a study in terms of students' uh, opinions about uh, classes on weekends. You know that there are inherent differences in the population, so you will use first years or undergrads and postgrads separately because they would inherently feel different from Just that. that. One insert footnote from Renee here. If I did a quantitative project, I would need a uh, population as a, as a frame of reference first. So my sampling takes place out of the population that is known and explained and talked about, the science is known. If I conducted qualitative research, I normally still take a sample, but I don't have to refer the sample back to the population, right? So I would mention normally in qualitative research the sampling method, but I'm not saying specifically from where, just how I got the candidates in for the interviews. So here we have convenience, quota, Ferguson, and snowball sampling. There are others too. There's a compelling case, there's a best case, there's a worst case. I can, I can make deviance up on this side. Let's go through them. Convenience sampling is what it is. It means you go into a shopping mall because it's convenient to go stand there and target the poor mothers for the babies. It's convenient. But that takes away a lot of the generalizability of your research because you're targeting a specific group. You can also do the same with the old babies in a coffee shop. I don't take it. I don't take it. And down you go. That's convenient solving. So you're doing this because it's convenient to you. So there's a tool that's used quite a lot actually. So what you do, you decide, because of time issues probably, that I'm going to cut this off when I get the first hundred responses in. So I'll accept, accept, accept. By the time I get to 100, the rest can go. So the first hundred that comes in are the hundred that I'm going to use. Inherent flaw that that will contain those who have a specific issue. So 
it's blowing up some of the issues because they feel so strongly that they need to respond to you. Maybe